Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. I said, praise the Lord, Bridgeway. One more time for the Holy Spirit. You ready? Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. I'm so glad you are here in the house of the Lord. We are in the third portion of a four-week series called Bold. We've talked about courage. We've talked about strength. Next week, it will end with faith, and uh, Minister Juan Delgado is going to speak at our, at our Owens Mills Reisterstown campus, and um, Bible teacher Kevin Turpin, the second, is going to be here to speak and close it out. It's Palm Sunday. Sure hope you come back for that. But today, we're going to talk about hope. And uh, aren't you uh, touched by Eric Barkey's story and his faith at the same time? Thank you, Eric for sharing your life with us and uh, just being able to walk together in community here at uh, Bridgeway Community Church. And Bruce Willis has nothing on you. So, my man, my man. Well, how about we, uh, we ask God to go with us now as we talk about hope. You ready for that? Okay, come on, let's talk to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our hope. We thank you for our dear brother, Eric, his wife, his daughters. Thank you for every family in this place. And Lord, we just affirm our hope in you. Be our comfort, be our refuge, be our strength. Restore hope to those that may have lost it in some way, shape, or form as they listen to me, whether they're in our Owens Mills campus or whether they're at home or in their car or in their bed or in this house, wherever they are, Lord, might you raise up hope in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Together at Bridgeway, everyone said amen. amen and amen. By the way, happy St. Patrick's Day for all of our Irish folk. You know, we multicultural, so you're Irish up in here. Happy, happy St. Patrick's Day. Put your hands together for all the Irish folk. Come on. So, you know, that's what uh, sort of green is all about. If you see green, you know it's all about uh, life, if you will. And uh, I understand that some people even drink beer that's green. I don't, don't have any experience with that, but I know you all do at Bridgeway. But my whole point is <laughs> the color green is about new, new beginnings, vibrant life, uh, restoration, fruitfulness, vitality, Fertility, it can be encapsulated in Psalm 1-3. For those of you who know the very first psalm, it's sort of represented in that. It says, uh, he, meaning the righteous man, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit and season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. That's uh, that color green prospering in a tree. It's bold, if you will. And its beauty represents life and a sense of hope. And friends, that's our subject today. We're talking about hope. In Psalm 25, which was read to you earlier, and I'm going to turn there in a moment, the psalmist David is trying to live out what he was instructed to do in Psalm, in Psalm 1 and in Psalm 2. He desires to take God as his refuge, and he desires to walk in the ways of God. And just like I quoted in Psalm 1 about the righteous man being like a tree planted by the rivers of water, this is exactly what David wants and is praying for in Psalm 25. David's not simply relying on the strength of his personality or his natural talents or his spiritual gifts or his education or any of these great attributes that he might possess. He knows that his hope cannot be in any of these things. And it's true for us as well. So David declares that his hope is in the Lord. And if you'll turn with me now to Psalm 25, let's go and get to the end of that chapter and, and look at verse 21. And this is what it says, and you heard it earlier when Eric read it. May integrity and uprightness protect me. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. That was David's conclusion 
at the end of Psalm 25. Now, he had mentioned this two other times in the passage, but this was like his final declaration that his hope was in the Lord. In fact, he mentions this hope three times. So we see it in verse 21. Now let's go backwards. We'll see it in verse 5, and then we'll see it in verse 3. So you can see the three times, if you have your Bible open or if you have it on your phone, these are the three times we see it in chapter 25. We read verse 21. Let's go backwards to verse 5. David says, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. Here it is. And my hope is in you all day long. And then you back it up to verse 3, and it says, no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. You see, when David prays and talks about this hope, what is he trying to express David is expressing that his hope is in someone and that his hope is over something. Now, we already know who that someone is because he said it three times, my hope is in God. And when you look at those three verses, notice hope is just not hanging out there. It's in someone. In verse 3, my hope is in you all day long. In verse 5, no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. In verse 21, because my hope is in you. You see, this is an important decision and an important distinction that we all must make. There's hope in something, but more importantly, there's hope in someone. And what happens is sometimes we may get this wrong, but as believers, we must get the someone right. And the someone is God. Otherwise, what will happen is we have misplaced hope. And if we hope in the wrong someone, it can leave us devastated. It can leave us disappointed. It can lead us into a disillusionment, a depression, because we misplaced our hope in the wrong person. And so it's so important as as people who have been created by God, God is saying, put your hope in me. And oftentimes what happens is we place our faith and our trust and our hope in others. And I mean, it's okay to hope that things will turn around, but we must make sure that we don't misplace the hope we should have in God in other people, places, or things. And so it's a real simple message, and that's really the first major point I want to make sure to get across, and that is this, that we must place our hope in God. We must place our hope in God, not just a higher power, God, not a religious leader or a pastor, God, not in a philosophy a program, or a new pill on the market. God, not another person, no matter how nice or godly or fine or gifted they are, we must ultimately place all of our hope in who? In God. And misplaced hope leads to disillusioned hearts. If we're not careful, we might automatically shift our hopes and our dreams onto another person without even realizing it. It happens happens all the time. The shift can be so automatic. It's It's so unlike a manual shifting in a car. Anybody know what a stick shift is? Does anybody drive a stick shift? Not too many of you. Some of you do. And... Have any of you driven a stick shift? Have any of you driven a stick shift at the top of a hill? And then you're stopped, and now it's time to go. What happens? I mean, you gotta gotta work this thing out, don't you? Okay, can I get a confession? Anybody ever just roll backwards? That's what happened to me when I stole my sister's car. I was a teenager, you know, it's not one of my best stories, but I was about 16 years old, wasn't really walking with the Lord, and she was out somewhere. So I decided to, to, to find her keys and take her vet. 
I know, he said that was bold. There you go, hey, hey, it was bold. See, I've been bold all my life, yeah. Bold for the devil, now I'm trying to be bold for God. Okay, amen. <laughs> Did I mention it was a bet? Yeah, man, it was mad. It was bad. I mean, it was, a, um, it was silver. It had a little um, burgundy pinstripe. I mean, it was probably one of the best vets, uh, Chevettes, I had ever, <laughs> ever driven. And, and, no, seriously, this Chevette was the bomb. Any, anybody know what a Chevette is? Do they, even, <laughs> do they even make those anymore? Yeah, along with the Pacers. Okay, so anyway. So I, I steal her little hatchback Chevette, and I go on to this street, and it gets to a hill. And I realized I'd never driven a stick before, but I'd watched her enough, so I figured I knew what to do. And clearly, I didn't. You, and I started rolling backwards, and the rest of the story is not pretty. I got in trouble, and, and there you have it. Thank God I'm not in prison, because it was my sister. But here's the thing. When it comes to our hopes, We actually don't have the manual shift. We just kind of like automatically shift. Let me me see if you understand what I'm talking about. Now when you get in the car, for those of you who don't have a a stick shift, you hardly even know when you're changing gears. You just kind of press the pedal, and it can go from one gear to the next gear to the next gear. You know you're going faster, but for some of you, depending on the vehicle that you have, you may not even feel the actual shift. And I think in like manner, our hope gears automatically shift onto other people without us even realizing it. And although we don't manually shift in our minds to say, you know, I'm placing my hope and my expectations in this person, that automatic shifting takes place in our subconscious minds. And this is what we have to be careful of. Because if we're not careful, we begin placing our hopes in our kids. We begin placing our hopes in our spouses. Automatic gear shift. We start placing our hopes or misplacing our hopes in our companies, in our contracts, in our jobs, in our paychecks, our friends, our family, even our pastors. Automatic gear shift. So the psalmist David is teaching us, get your hope in the right gear, the God gear. Fully place your hope in God and God alone. And when we place our hope in in the God gear, we can count on the fact that he will never fail us. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. We can count on him. So the first major point that I want to make sure to get across is that we must place our hope in who? In God. Secondly, I want want you to notice that in the passage, he's also expressing his hope over something. Not only in God, but David, hope in God is over his shame. So that's the second point. We must put our hope over shame. And just like he mentioned hope three times, he mentions shame three times in verse 2, in verse 3, and in verse 20. Listen to what he says. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Verse 3, no one whose hope is in the Lord will ever be put to shame. Verse 20, guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. So he mentions hope three times. He mentions shame three times. And friends, fear of shame and embarrassment is real. It was real in David's day. It's real in our day. And in our day, it may take on the form of of social media. But shame and embarrassment, none of us want that. And it's a big deal, especially with our young people today. So much fear and so much shame and, and so much needing to protect ourselves from looking bad and embarrassment. And David didn't want to be put to shame either by his enemies. You see, if we misplace our hope, we may be put to shame. I mean, we feel ashamed by our own failures. We feel ashamed by what has happened to us. We, we feel ashamed for not measuring up or showing up when, we, when 
we should show up to do all we can do or be all we can be. And man, there's enough shame to go around, isn't there? But to help him with the shame, David calls on God to, to somehow put this hope over the shame. And the way he does it is he asks God to remember a few things. In fact, David is relying on God's memory. He's, his hope is in God's divine memory. And so now three times he says, remember, remember, remember. Hope, hope, hope. Shame, shame, shame. But God, listen, remember, remember, remember. Uh, check out verse 6 and verse 7, and we'll see remember three times. In verse 6, oh, remember, O oh Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. The second time, remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways according to your love. Remember me, for you are good, O oh Lord. Remember, remember, remember. Does anybody need God to remember his great mercy? He like, Lord, would you please remember <laughs> that you're merciful? Because <laughs> I don't need you to forget that. I mean, I can think of a few things you can forget. This ain't one of them. <laughs> I don't want you to forget your great mercy. Anybody? Yeah. Does anybody need God to remember not their sins? Now, Lord, if you could just forget, if you could just forget about all of them, if I could just give you a list of all the things I want you to forget about. I mean, thank God for not only his divine memory, thank God for his divine amnesia. Anybody grateful that God just forgets some things? Amen, amen. Today you will be liberated from that shame because God is going to just forget about it. Anybody, can you just say forget about it, Lord? Yeah. Lord, just forget about it. Please cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Please just dump it in the sea of forgetfulness. And God says in the book of Jeremiah this, he says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will, here it is, remember their sins no more. Can you get a hallelujah for that one? Good Lord. And then David in Psalm 103 says it like this, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us for our iniquities. In verse 11 and 12, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Is anybody glad about that? because the east is a long way from the west, and they're going in opposite directions. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but why would he do it? Why would he just take my sins and take them as far as the east is from the west? Well, in the same chapter, in Psalm 103, verse 14, it says why. This is what it says. For he knows how we are formed. And he, here it is, remembers that we are dust. Think about that. Lord, don't forget your great mercy. Remember your great mercy. And remember that I, I'm dust. He remembers that he picked up the dirt and created you. He knows that you are clay pots. He knows that you are, are, are made from, from the ground, that you are flesh and that you are blood. He is not expecting you to be divine. He's expecting you to allow his, his powerful divine nature to have access in your clay pots, in your fleshly bodies. He remembers, David says, that we are, we are dust. You see, God's memory reigns supreme even over ours. Because people forget, even parents may forget you or forsake you. David says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. It's possible that even the very people that gave birth and raised you at some point could turn on you. May it never be so, but the reality is this life is real. And in this life, there are a lot of things that can disappoint us. And even if we misplace our hope on our parents or on our loved ones, it can be very disillusioning 
So what have we said? I mean, others may forsake you, others may forget you, others may fail you, but number one, we must place our hope in God. And number two, we must put our hope over our shame. Well, how do you do that? We put our hope over our shame by claiming it. Claim that your hope in God will cover your shame. The next time you feel shame creeping up, just say, God, I am claiming that my hope in you is greater than my shame. You've got to speak it. You've got to say it. Say, I choose to place my hope in you, God. I don't choose to live in this place called shame. God, you are my hope. You're my living hope. You're my only hope. I am putting my shame up against my claim, and I claim my hope is in you. And I believe that, I, and I, with certainty, that I can be joyful in hope, as Romans 12, 12 says. And so this is what we see. His hope is in God. Puts his hope over shame by claiming that this truth is there and the ability of God's hope can cover our shame. And third and finally, we must pin our hope on the future. We must pin our hope on the future. See, the Bible says that we don't grieve like those who have no hope. Brother Eric, our prayer is that you'll see your boy again. So you, have, you have that future hope. You have that belief. Like If you're not a believer, how do you have any hope after death? How do you have any hope for the future? But the Bible teaches us that we can have hope, not only in this life, but in the life to come. It's that future hope that brings us joy and peace. Paul puts it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, sisters are included. We do not want you to be ignorant about those who, who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men and women who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That is our hope. He died, he rose again from the dead, and we will rise again too. That's where our hope is. How do you live this life with no hope in the one that created you? This is what keeps us going when we realize that this is not all there is, that God has more for us. He has a purpose and he has a plan and he has a future for us. And that's where our hope is. It's not in this world. It's not in this life. It's not in other people. It's in God who created the heavens and the earth. It's in God who formed us from the dust. It's from God who put his fingerprints on us as he created us and knitted us in our mother's womb. I put my hope in the one who created me. I put my hope in the one who can change me, who can transform me, who can be with me in all of my sad, sorrowful, and six situations. First Thessalonians 4, 16 says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven and with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. It then says, therefore, encourage each other with these words. Friends, we're supposed to encourage one another and remind one another that this world is not all there is. And that's why we come to church. We come to church because when we are in the assembly of the righteous with other people, we are reminded that our life in our home is bigger than this world. And you can get so down in this world. And church reminds you when you're singing that worship and when you're lifting up the Lord, it's reminding us that God is even bigger than my problems. 
He's bigger than my circumstances. He's bigger than my anxiety. He's bigger than my depression. He's bigger than the breakup I just had with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. He's bigger than the rent that I owe. He's a God that can do anything at any time in any way. Remind me how big God is. That's what church is for. It's to remind you how big God is. It's to remind you that God is bigger than your circumstances, that God is bigger than your issues, that God is bigger than your divorce, that God is bigger than your disease, that God is bigger than your cancer, that God is bigger than any situation that you are going through. You got to come to church. You got to come home because when you come into the house of the Lord, you are reminded that God is bigger. Hallelujah. I think that's a good place for a praise break. You want to praise God right now? Go ahead and stand to your feet if you want to and give God a bold praise. Thank God that he's bigger. He's bigger, he's bigger. He is the best physician. He is the best lawyer. He's never lost a case. He's never lost a patient. He's a God that can go in your hotel room and meet you. He can go in your hospital room and meet you. He's bigger. He's bigger than your biggest loss. He's bigger than your greatest pain. He's bigger than your cheapest sin. He's bigger. He's bigger. Hallelujah. Encourage one another with these words. Remind people that God is bigger. Hmm, hallelujah. You may take your seat. Our hope is in God for a future with him. We have a living hope. We have a future. The reason why people get depressed and become self-harming is because they have lost all hope. They become hopeless. In Christ, you don't have to be hopeless if you're in him. There is no hopelessness in Christ. Jesus Christ is our living hope. You can be hope-filled today. We can be hope-filled because hope stands for holding on to promised expectations. Holding on to promised expectations. God is a promise keeper. You can hold on to his word. If he promised it, you can hold on to it. You can take it to the bank. Holding on to promised expectations by God. I can hold on to the promises of God. And God's promises give us hope. His promises give us a future. Jeremiah 29, 11, some of you know this. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you what? Hope and a what? And a future. Hope in God gives us a future. When you don't have a sense of future hope, it can drive you into a place of hopelessness. So I came to tell you this morning, whether you're in your kitchen or in your car, I came by the Owens Mills Rice Sound campus to say, I came to Columbia to say, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Put your trust in God. Place your hope in God. Put your hope over your shame. Pin your hope on the future. Now, let me give you just a couple of practical applications. Two of them. Number one, encourage others to keep hope alive. Encourage others to keep hope alive. When you come to church, what I want you to do is I want you to come not just to sing and to hear the word and to, to give or, or, or serve. All of that is great. But like I told some friends on the radio uh, just this week, I said, as you prepare to go to church, I want you to go to church to encourage somebody. Ask God how you can be an encouragement. Just a handshake. Just a hug. Just a word when you look into somebody's eyes can be the reason why God wanted you to come to church that day. That could be the reason why God wanted you to sit in the row you're sitting in. 
There could be a reason why you're passing somebody in the lobby or even in the restroom. You see, you don't know what that person's going through. You don't know what that person's dealing with. You don't have to be a minister, a clergy person, or a pastor, or on the altar prayer team. You don't have to do that to be an encouragement. No credentials except having the word of God and you to be encouraged yourself and to pass that encouragement on to somebody else. That's your practical application. Be an encouragement to somebody. Can you, can you receive that practical application? Okay? Okay, so it's not all about you. I mean, some of it's about you. That's why you came and the Lord loves you. But it's also about other people and God uses people to touch people. Right? So I know it's easy to kind of come in and slip out. I get that. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes you, it took so much for you to just get here and get a seat in a corner or up, up in the balcony or, or somewhere. I get that. But at some point, I'm asking that God would turn it around because as you begin to heal, you realize, you know what? This time, I'm not just going to slip in and slip out. This time, I'm going to tarry just a little bit in the Real Talk corridor or in the lobby by the fireplace or on my way out in the parking lot. I'm just going to stop and say, hey, how you doing? I want to encourage you today. Hope in the Lord. Sometimes that's all somebody needs. Just a little word. They don't need a whole sermon. Just a word. When people greet me in the, in the um, lobby when I'm out there, it's just a word of encouragement I want to give. We don't have time to do a whole counseling session, but I can give you a word. And I think God will use all of you to do it if you'll just say in your heart, I want to be an encouragement to somebody today. Amen. Do you receive that? Okay, here's a second Here's a, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I should probably say this, though, because, you know, when we deal with such difficult topics, sometimes some of you are triggered or dealing with some very, very difficult issues, and you need prayer support. That's why we have an altar prayer team at Owens Mills, and here you can pray with somebody afterwards. But it's possible that you're struggling with thoughts of suicide. And we always say, you know, if you're suicidal, one first thing you need to do is call 911 and get to a hospital. Okay, it doesn't make you crazy. You're just in a very, very difficult spot and you don't know what to do and it seems like that's your only option. So call 911. Or there's a crisis hotline. You can text 988, just three, three numbers. Text 988 and somebody will be there from a lifeline to help you. But when you're encouraging people, whether it's in a hospital or 988, even if it's just in this house right here, it's okay to pray with somebody. Pray with somebody afterwards at the altar. That's, these people are trained to just pray with you. Pray online with a clergy person. There's somebody online right now that, that will pray with you and connect with you. I mean, that's one of the things that we do to encourage one another. We pray. You can send an e-prayer request. Did you know that? There's an e-prayer team. You just send the request and they'll pray for you. We also have our Mental Health and Faith Network. If you go to bridgeway.cc, you look for the Mental Health and Faith Network, all kind of resources to help us deal with all the different issues we have to deal with. Let me give you the second and final uh, practical application. I really like this one. <clears throat> Memorize the promises of God. Remember what hope stands for, holding on to promised expectations. So, you know, you can't remember, remember all of them, right? But you can remember some of them, or even like your top three. So what I did is I came up with a top 10 list, and I'm going to read them to you. And, and maybe one of these is the one that you like, or maybe three of these, who knows. But this is just from the scripture, so you can see it. And you can always take a picture of the, of the screen if you want to. Here are my top 10. Number one, promises of God. I love all of them, though, y'all. Hebrews 13, 5, you ready? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 4.10, 4110. Fear not. Why? I am with you. Matthew 11.28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Somebody needed that verse right there, I bet. Number four. But those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Here's the fifth one. 
Jeremiah 29, 11. We read it earlier. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Number six. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this one, even my kids remembered when they were a young age. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'll never forget when Luke was on top of Isaiah as kids and they were fighting and Luke is punching. He's like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm like, son, that's not the way you're supposed to use the Bible, but <laughs> praise the Lord. Lisa's, Lisa's in them. All right, number eight. <laughs> No weapon formed against you will prosper, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Number nine, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And number 10, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Those are your 10. Now listen. I'm going to read them one more time if you'll tarry with me, but this is what I want you to do this time. Because now that I went through them, the one that hits you right now, you know, people say, what's your life verse? I was like, well, it depends on what my life's like right now. <laughs> you know, I don't have a life verse. <laughs> I have life verses. <laughs> okay, anyway, so it's the same with the promises. Uh, what promise just kind of connects with your spirit right now? And I'm going to read it, and what I want you to do is stand up for that promise and then remain standing, okay? You got it? So here, here are the ten. I will never leave you nor forsake you at Owens Mills, even in your house. Fear not, I am with you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purposes. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. No weapon formed against you will prosper and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Two more. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Last one. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you can't remember any of these promises, when you get into a hopeless moment, maybe you can just remember this old song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand One more time, no music. On Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Praise the Lord. And all of Bridgeway said amen and amen.